Why are so many people messing around with peptides instead of just using good old growth hormone? Well, in this video, I'm going to break down the difference between growth hormone and the peptides that influence it so that you can answer that question for yourself. For the sake of science and understanding here, don't mistake this video for medical advice or the opinion of the medical community as a whole. I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. And today I'm simply explaining the science behind what people are already doing in the real world. Let me give you a rundown on growth hormone that will make this video make sense. There are a few key hormones you need to know a little bit about. The big daddy, of course, for this video is growth hormone. It's your body's repair crew. It comes out from your pituitary, mostly at night. It repairs tissue, mobilizes fat, and signals long-term cellular adaptation to stress. It does all of that when insulin from the pancreas, which comes out when you eat, is low. To put it as simple as I can, if you're in a fasted state or if you're in deep sleep, you have low blood sugar and low insulin. When you have low insulin, you also have low levels of something called somatostatin, which normally locks the door on the release of growth hormone from your pituitary. So again, when you're in a fasted state, you have low insulin and low somatostatin and an unlocked door on growth hormone. Now in the background, when you're fasted or hungry, you also have a hormone made mostly in the gut called ghrelin. It's a hunger hormone, which comes out and keeps somatostatin low, keeping the door unlocked. And you also have ghrelin's buddy, growth hormone releasing hormone, who comes up to the door to let growth hormone know, hey, you can come out now. And voila, you get growth hormone sneaking out the door to do its thing. I hope that made sense to you. Now let's talk about peptides and HGH or synthetic growth hormone. Peptides, the ghrelin mimetics and the growth hormone releasing hormone peptides like sermorelin, tessamorelin, CJC1295, ipamorelin, hexarelin, GHRP2, GHRP6, that's not all of them, but they can amplify the signaling of ghrelin and growth hormone releasing hormone depending on the peptide. HGH bypasses the entire system entirely and replaces it. It doesn't even have to mess with the pituitary or your hunger cues. And so you should be able to see now that there's a difference between using peptides to optimize your biology and using growth hormone to just override it. Let's talk more about HGH. There's a misunderstanding that HGH is a muscle building drug. It's really not, not in the same way that say testosterone is. You see, growth hormone is more of a polishing compound. It's a quality of life drug. People tend to use it for nagging injuries, collagen repair, connective tissue healing, fat loss, better sleep, better skin, thicker hair, and sometimes strength. And honestly, it sounds incredible when you list all of that out. So why don't I prescribe it to everyone? Well, the reason is because the risks are very real with growth hormone and the cost is also pretty high. Using exogenous or synthetic HGH as a drug can raise blood sugar and cause insulin resistance over time because in a regulated normal system, growth hormone tells your body, stop burning sugar, put a lock on insulin receptors. We don't need that right now. Let's start burning fat because we need high octane fuel here to do the repairs. And this is how growth hormone is used as a fat burner. But it also turns on gluconeogenesis or the making of sugar from the liver in order for your brain to keep running. Because while the rest of your body can switch to burning fat, your brain is kind of a sugar snob. It needs that glucose to keep the lights on. But when you override this process by giving your body growth hormone whenever you want, if this goes on too long, the growth hormone has your cells not responding to insulin entirely, locking the sugar out and leaving it to sit in your blood. And then the pancreas tries to pump more and more insulin out in order to get your blood sugar down. And this is how a repair hormone can accidentally lead to insulin resistance. In fact, there are documented cases of people using growth hormone long-term and then developing diabetes or making their bodies more prone to it. And there are more side effects to using growth hormone too. A lot of people will get water retention because growth hormone tells your kidneys to hold on to salt in the bloodstream, causes fluid to build up in the tight spaces like the carpal tunnel in your wrist, literally squeezing the nerves down in there. And long-term or excessive use of growth hormone can lead to visceral organ growth and changes in bone structure, like a bigger jaw or a bigger brow. And I can't not mention that while growth hormone doesn't cause cancer, if someone already has an active tumor in their body and they're using growth hormone, growth hormone can act like a fertilizer, causing the tumor to grow faster. 
There are some practical downsides too. HGH is a long-term commitment. People will often run it for six months to a year because the big cosmetic or fat loss benefits don't show up right away. And then there's the cost of it. Real pharmaceutical human growth hormone is quite expensive. A typical kit can cost anywhere from $300 to well over a thousand, depending on the brand. And sure, there are cheaper kits online, but you might also be injecting something that belongs in a science fair volcano, not in your body. So to compare growth hormone to peptides that influence growth hormone, here's some differences. So HGH replaces the hormone entirely and peptides stimulate your body to make its own. Because HGH bypasses your natural safety systems, its side effects tend to be heavier. We just discussed this. Peptides, which do have a milder effect, create a more natural pulsatile growth hormone release. So their side effects are usually more mild, things like flushing or extra hunger. And they do still come with the kind of cancer caution. One of the big reasons people choose peptides over human growth hormone is that HGH shuts down your natural production of it while peptides, they don't do that. Within days of taking HGH, your pituitary will stop producing it. And then if you stop growth hormone abruptly, your production of it will stay stunned until the pituitary kind of resets itself, which it can and usually does. But peptides don't shut down your natural production at all. When you stop them, everything keeps running as naturally as it already was. Now, timing of using HGH and peptides is another big difference. HGH is usually taken in the morning while fasted because it mobilizes fat and if you've eaten, insulin will block growth hormone. So it has to be done fasted. Taking it before the first meal of the day lets your body actually use that freed up fat for fuel. Peptides on the other hand are usually taken before bed a few nights per week because they amplify your body's biggest natural growth hormone pulse, which happens during the first two hours a deep sleep. But here's something most people don't pay attention to. There's a reason why peptides tend to be cycled. You see, peptides kind of yell at the pituitary. And if you yell at the pituitary every single night without a break in between, the pituitary eventually puts on some noise canceling headphones and that's called receptor desensitization. So it's important that if people choose peptides that they cycle them or they take days off. Not because it's cool, it's just your biology will thank you. And HGH works differently, right? If it bypasses the pituitary entirely and talks directly to growth hormone receptors on the liver, fat, and muscle, well, those receptors are disposable. When growth hormone binds to a receptor, the cell literally internalizes it and it replaces it with a brand new receptor. It's like when Pac-Man eats a ghost and then another one instantly pops back into the game. That's why growth hormone doesn't cause the same receptor burnout the peptides do. And if people are taking it, they have to take it every single day. There's also the issue of ceilings. Peptides have a saturation point. The pituitary can only release so much growth hormone at once. More peptide does not always equal more growth hormone. Using synthetic growth hormone, however, has no natural ceiling. So if you take 10 units, you get 10 units. And that's why bodybuilders love it. But it's also why they run the risk of having high fasting blood sugar. Now this question usually comes into play. If using growth hormone shuts down your body's natural production of it, will your natural production come back when you stop? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. The pituitary is incredibly resilient. It doesn't atrophy like the testicles do with steroid use. Even after six to 12 months of daily growth hormone use, once you stop it, it takes a few days, but natural growth hormone production usually comes back. So the big question, which one's better? I mean, HGH is the nuclear option. It's more powerful, the results can be dramatic and better, but the risks are higher, the suppression is guaranteed, and the cost is pretty significant. Peptides are more of a lifestyle option. They work with your biology instead of replacing it, they tend to be safer, and for many people, they provide most of the benefits of growth hormone without the same downsides. But today's video was more about explaining the science behind what people are already experimenting with. I'm Dr. Ashley Frazee. I'm a primary care doctor in Mesa, Arizona. I don't take insurance and that's why I have the time to talk about this stuff with people. And I just like to know the science behind why people do what they do. If you like this video, please hit like for me and subscribe to my channel and I'll keep doing more research. You guys have the best day.